I'm glad that you could join me on Sewing with Nancy. Today's topic is Easy Does It Knits. I'll show you how to mix and match four major wardrobe components, tops, a jacket, pants, and skirt, to create a flexible wardrobe. Vicki showcases our first combination, a knit jacket, pants, and top. With a change of just one component, the look changes as well. Yes, you can buy all these items, most likely at twice the cost, but half the fun of creating them yourself. Discover the joy of Easy Does It Knits next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's how-to sewing program with Nancy Zeman is being brought to you by FOF, the largest European producer of sewing machines. FOF's creative line of sewing machines and hobby lock sergers are simply the best. Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears for home, classroom, and industry. Ginger scissors and shears are the choice of professionals. Madeira thread from Germany with superior quality and smart packaging to make it a sensational value. Preferred by home and professional embroiderers everywhere. Oxmoor House, the publisher of innovative sewing, quilting, and craft books, including books by Nancy Zeman. Prim Dritz, the source for sewing and quilting notions, including products by Dritz, Collins, and Omnigrid. And Nancy's Notions Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and unique hard-to-find sewing notions and supplies. On Lesson on Sewing Knits, Beth starts off by an identification of all the variety of knit fabrics. There are many. The single knit, or a single knit, is the sample that I have on the top. It has 25 to 50 percent stretch and it always rolls to the right side. Lightweight, used in tops. We'll see some tops made of this fabric a little bit later. Interlock is a double knit. Some of you who have sewn for a while, double knit kind of has a bad connotation of heavy polyester fabric. This is lightweight, a cotton or cotton polyester blended double knit. Looks the same on right side as it does on the wrong side. Again, good for skirts and for pants. Ponte is another double knit, a little bit heavier for jackets, like the jacket I'm wearing has this fabric in it, a beefier weight. The ribbing in this bright color has up to 50% stretch or more. It's used around the banding. Just like a single knit, a high loft fleece has many of the same characteristics. It rolls to the right side, almost looks reversible. Again, great for outerwear and sportswear. And a Berber, another knit, has a Sherpa look on the outside on a knit backing. It is not reversible. Believe it or not, from a single knit to a very beefy knit, many of the construction techniques are the same. Most knit patterns are multiple sized. They have multiple patterns nested together. You'll need to trace off your pattern size, and I've traced off from this jacket pattern the basic pattern pieces that I need for this project. You don't have to transfer everything, every single stitching line. I put a little slash where there are the notches. Rather than the V's, I just put a little slash. The grain line is very important. The hem allowance at the bottom, and this also needed the marking for the center front for the button placement of the jacket. I have a ponte weight fabric on the table that has been pre-treated. I like to pre-wash it to get rid of any sizing or any shrinkage that may occur. For laying out of this pattern piece, I have matched the cut edges, or I should say the selvages, at the lower edge. This is 60 plus inches wide, so it's bigger than my table. You'd be working on a flat surface. I always place the pattern pieces on the fold first. For this pattern, the back pattern piece is placed on the fold, and I usually use a few pins just to anchor it in this area. Then I'll place weights around the other portions of the pattern. You certainly could use other pins, but since this is easy does it knits, I want to sew as quickly and efficiently as possible. I'll just weight down the pattern piece. For the front pattern piece, I need to get the grain line parallel to the fold line. Measuring from the arrow to the fold and placing one pin in the fabric, anchoring it down, and then make it, making sure the same distance, it's 16 inches, is measured from the end of the arrow. Now this is a review for most of you, but it definitely bears repeating if you've never worked with knits before. Then after doing the anchoring, you could then move the pin pattern weights to the next pattern piece. First of all, I just usually anchor down at the grain line all the pattern pieces. I'm just going to do a few pattern pinnings for you right now. When cutting 
I'm going to be using uh, shears, the eight inch long shears, and this particular shears has a micro serrated blade, perfect for knit fabrics, kind of grabs it and makes the cutting go a little bit smoother than just a regular scissors. Now without a lot of pins, and since this fabric is stable, you don't have to worry too much about shifting, but generally I put my left hand, since I'm right-handed, along the fabric just to hold down the pattern piece to make sure that I'm cutting accurately. Use as long a stride as possible for all your cutting techniques. This jacket pattern only has a main, few main pattern pieces, front, back, sleeve, and then some facings, so there is very little cutting to do. Then after cutting, we're going to do some marking. The main marking will be the nips. If the pattern has a 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance, then I would place nips at the notches. I think I said that those were nips. Those were notches in the patterns. I just placed little fourth of an inch clips, and then also at the hemline, place a nip. If your pattern had only a fourth of an inch seam allowances, which is also common on some pattern pieces, then you may want to use some pattern dots just to place these on the wrong side of the fabric so you would know where the various little markings are to be placed. Either technique works out very well for the basic cutting and marking of the fabric. Now it's time for the simple seaming. When seaming knits, you need to take into consideration the stretch of the fabric. There's a tremendous amount of stretch in the crosswise direction, some knits more than others. The length is stable. Some angled seams, for example, on skirt seams, will have, again, some more stretch. So to accommodate that stretch, we're going to set the machine differently for different types of seams. I have a stretch needle put in my machine. They're many times blue in color, or have a little blue color around the band have a pre to prevent skipping of stitches. And generally, for a stable seam, I just use a straight stitch. And I'm going to slightly lengthen the stitch, about 10 stitches per inch as I'm sewing this, for the first row of stitching. If you have five-eighths of an inch seam allowances after doing this one stitch, then simply trim the seam down to a fourth of an inch. You don't have to measure, just eyeball this down. If your pattern came with fourth of an inch seam allowances, of course, then you wouldn't have to worry about this. Now set your machine for a zigzag stitch and zigzag over the edge, encasing both seams and allowing for stretch. And then gives us a test to see how it stretches. Now if by chance you hear a little pop on your test seam, that first row, instead of using just a straight stitch, use a very elongated zigzag. I set my width at one and it has a little extra stretch, but yet when it's pressed open, it will look flat. And now for a serge seam. Sergers and knits are meant to go together. There's no easier way to create knit fabrics or fashions than to serge them. I have my machine set up for a four thread overlock stitch. Notice all four cones are matching my fabric, or matching as close as possible. When pinning on serge fabrics, you can pin one of two ways. Either pinning so that the pins are perpendicular to the cut edge, making certain that you remove them before serging, because the blade would nick them otherwise, or pin with the pins parallel to the edge, and then just remove them as you're sewing. You cannot serge over pins, so make sure that you pay special note of this. Keep in mind that when serging, the machine trims out the excess seam allowances, stitches the seam, and then overlaps the edges, or overlocks the edges at once. I serged across the seam, and you can see what great stretch this has. It's just really fast and really fun to work on knits and sergers. On shoulder seams and garments, you will find, in ready to wear, and might as well do it at home too, that when you're serging a shoulder seam to keep it very stable, to serge over clear elastic. This stretches a lot, and the elastic allows the shoulder seam to have great retention to come back to its original size. This stretches up to three times its width or length, and then just springs back into shape. We have very simple seaming here. This pattern called for a fourth of an inch seam allowances, so that's why I have the clear elastic aligned with the cut edge of the fabric, lower the presser foot, and serge. So it's no different than working with a traditional seam, just serging over the clear elastic for those stable shoulder seams. And you can see again, it just springs back into shape. It's really fast and fun. 
The next seam I'd like to detail is setting in the sleeve. S knit sleeves, like almost all sleeves, have a slight amount of ease in the fabric. The sleeve is cut larger than the armhole, but in knits, not a, not a great deal. You do not have to do any easing stitch. Instead, just sew, or serge in this case, with the sleeve portion next to the feed dog, to the base of the machine. I placed a few pins in the sleeve, at the underarm area, at the notches, and at the cap of the sleeve. The rest of the easing I can take place, or matching, can take place as I'm doing the serging. This pattern, again, called for a fourth of an inch seam allowance, so I'm not going to be trimming off any extra fabric, maybe just a little extra to make the edges even. And as I get to the area where the sleeve is a little bit larger than the armhole, I simply just meet the fabrics together, kind of finger pin them, and the excess fabric will ease in by the feed dogs. Just taking a little extra time to doing the serging. Now, if you didn't have a serger at this point, you'd simply use that straight stitch and zigzag seam to put the two together. Take a little time as you're going around the corners, this curve, meet those cut edges, align them, and notice how this little extra fabric, if I didn't align them just perfectly, becomes perfect because it's trimmed off. And I'm on the home stretch, meeting one notch and then the rest. So you can see, working with a serge seam is a perfect combination with a knit fabric. Here's a very traditional knit finish, ribbing around the neckline. Make it a crew neck, a turtleneck, or a mock turtleneck. Either way, work with three steps, and I'll show you these right now. The key of working with a rib neckline is to use the proper fabric for the neckline finish. Ribbing is obvious choice. It has almost 100% stretch. It stretches quite a bit. It is meant for stretching out of shape and then going back together again. Whether you're considering using ribbing or you could also use self-fabric for the neckline finish, you'll have to do a little check on that fabric. For example, on this interlock fabric, if we wanted to check to see if it could be used as the ribbing, simply take about five inches of this fabric, and if it stretches beyond two and a half inches or 50%, you could definitely use it as the finish. So we could use a dressier look, use the interlock, or for a more sporty look, the ribbing finish. Cut the ribbing the size your pattern indicates, and sew the short seam together. Now with ribbing fabric, there really isn't a right or a wrong side. And then finger press the seam, meet the cut edges, as well as the wrong sides, making it into a tube. Many of you have done this many times. And then simply fold in half and place a cor pin at each half point, at the seam and at the opposite end. Then match the pins to quarter it. The quartering will help us determine where to place the ribbing on the neckline so that it's equally distributed around the neckline finish. On another sample, I have the neckline already quartered. You can see the four pins. I have still the wrong side of the fabric out. You can see my shoulder seam. And I have the pins. Now I'm simply going to meet the ribbing to the neckline. On this next sample, the ribbing has been pinned into place, pinning the ribbing to the right side of the fabric. To start to serge around the edge, I'm going to release the thread from the thread guide in the back. There's a stitch finger in the back of the thread where the thread overlocks. To release it, just simply pull those two top threads and then the back, pull the chain or the thread tail. That will allow you to start with a clean stitch. This pattern allowed or has a fourth of an inch seam allowance, so I can just align the fabric with the blade area, lower the presser bar, and simply stretch the ribbing to meet the neckline. As when working with the sleeve, we have the longer area, the neckline, meeting the feed dog area. Remember those feed dogs bite the fabric, ease it into place, and just surge all the way around the edges. This is fast sewing and goes together extremely easily. The main difference between a crew neckline, mock turtleneck, as well as a traditional turtleneck is just the size of the rib rib ribbing, the width of the ribbing. Now as I'm re reaching my starting point, you can see my thread tails, I will just surge until I slightly overlap my starting spot. Release the threads and surge off. 
and in a matter of a few minutes you can have that surged all the way around the edges and it meets perfectly. There's one final step you could do if you wanted to add a fourth step and that is to top stitch from the right side for a dressier finish in the neckline. Here's a classic jewel neckline with a streamlined way of finishing the edges. It's so easy you could create two tops in an evening. There are really two steps of creating the neckline for a jewel neckline. The first is to do some seam finishes. Either by serger or a zigzag sewing machine, you need to zigzag or serge the edge. And this sample shows both options. Notice that we have only a fourth of an inch seam allowance allo allowed along the neckline. If your pattern happened to have 5 eighths of an inch, please trim it in the neckline down to 3 eighths of an inch before doing the clean finishing. After doing the surging or zigzagging, then press under the seam allowance to the wrong side. A simple way of adding a special touch to make it go much faster would be to add a fusible thread into the bobbin or one of the loopers of your serger. Fusible thread has two plies and watch what happens when I give it a steam. It shrinks. And as it shrinks, what causes it when it's stitched in a seam, it will bond to the fabric, kind of like a basting step. On the top that is on the table, I have zigzagged the edges using the bobbin thread with the th having the th fusible thread in the bobbin. When I press it then to the wrong side of the fabric, it holds it in place. This is a very temporary basting, but works very well in these small little areas. If you are working on a serger, here's a close-up of the way you'd be serging. Serging on the wrong side of the fabric. Either place the fusible thread in the upper looper or the lower looper. You may like to slightly tighten the tension of that looper so the thread does not go over the edge. You don't want it to get on your iron. Either way, it really streamlines this technique. The next step is to put a double or a twin needle in your machine. A stretch needle is often blue in color or has a blue tint, while a stretch double needle has a blue band, as you can see here. The size you would use is a 3.0 or 4.0 double needle. The numbers refer to the distance between the needles. You'll only need one bobbin thread. You'll need two top threads, though. And when I work with my machine and have two threads, I always have one thread unwinding from the bobbin, or bottom, and the other thread unwinding from the top so that they don't get twisted up as they're going through the tension guides. Just a little hint. Now to do the stitching from the top of the fabric. The double needle has a little give in it because it, the bobbin is going between the two needles and you can just slowly stitch around the edge, top stitching this into place. It's fast. I have a 4.0 double needle in my machine right now. So the stitching will be a little bit wider apart, the stitching between the two threads, slightly wider than a 3.0, but still looks great. So after doing the surging, pressing, then you simply have to do the top stitching. And I think you can see why you would be able to make two tops in an evening with this simple technique. As you look at this stitching, you can see it's very close to the edge. On the underside, it almost looks like a zigzag because the bobbin thread had to go between the two needles. But again, a very professional look. There are only a few short keys to keep in mind when working with knits. For seaming, fourth of an inch seam allowances work best. Here's a straight stitch followed by a zigzag. Or on a serger, a four thread overlock stitch is the preference. On shoulder seams, serge over clear elastic for stretchability. And here's a great way to finish those jeweled necklines using a double needle and two threads. As you can see, we call this series Easy Desert Knits because truly they are easy. Here's a hint from Prim Dritz, the manufacturers of Collins quilting products. When hand quilting, Use the patented no-slip hoop with a unique tongue and groove shaping system to keep your quilt layers perfectly taut and stable. Simply place the fabric over the inner hoop. Loosen the outer hoop.
slip the outer hoop over the fabric and tighten the screws. The tongue and groove molding will lock the layers in place. When quilting, the perfect companion is a finger pin cushion. Keep extra threaded needles or pins in this convenient mini pin cushion. The no slip hoop and finger pin cushion are ideal quilting mates. Next, a hint from Oxmoor House. The book, Essential Sewing Guide, is a how-to book, but also a reference book. We often hear from readers that they use the many charts, including the needle and feet charts, on a frequent basis. In fact, one reader, Barbara Schaefer from Chicago, tapes samples next to the feet chart along with noting machine settings. She writes, my book is thick in spots and I suppose odd shaped, yet this personalization makes this book truly an essential guide for me. Welcome to Sewing with Nancy. Whenever someone asks me, what's the easiest fabric to sew, I quickly answer with one word, knits. Whether that's single or double knits, made of cotton, wool, polyester, or a combination of many fibers, knits are comfortable to wear and equally as easy to sew. I'll start with a technique I call the easiest rugby shirt. The placket is sewn with one stitching step. You'll soon see why I call this series Easy Does It Knits. That's what's next on Sewing with Nancy. Rugby shirts are a mainstay in many wardrobes for casual wear, for sports wear. And to make one is extremely easy, especially if we take a little time to change the pattern piece, the facing pattern piece. If you look at a rugby shirt, you'll notice that there is a placket, an underlay placket, and the placket is also part of the under portion of the buttonhole side. I'll show you how easy it is to get this to align up without a lot of work and very, very simple sewing. I traced a size medium on my pattern uh, for the shirt front and I placed a small piece of tissue paper over the top of the fabric or the top of the pattern. This tissue paper is extending one inch beyond the center front of the shirt. That's the first important measurement, one inch beyond the center front. Then trace the neckline, the cutting line of the shirt and your garment facing is going to have the same cutting line except it will be one inch longer. For the ruler, I'm going to measure to make certain that this is this facing is about seven inches long. And then across the lower edge, make a line that's four and a half inches wide. It doesn't have to be exact. This is just a rough measurement, but approximately seven inches. Across the shoulder seam, measure two and a half inches, or just the middle of the shoulder seam will be about the same thing. Then just simply connect the lower edge with the top edge. And now you've become a pattern designer, just like that. You may want to also transfer the grain line. This is your new facing piece. The extension that was placed at the one inch beyond the center front is going to be a fold. So you'd mark place on fold on that pattern piece and you're ready to cut this out. The pattern piece that I have already cut out also has interfacing placed on it. But let me just show you. If placed it on the fold with that one inch extension. Before actually fusing the interfacing, I do a little nipping or a clip, a clip at the center front fold and a, as well as another clip at the lower edge. It will help me marking a little bit later. So I take off the pattern piece and open this up. You'll see some markings as well as interfacing in place. I used a knit fusible interfacing, a lightweight fabric requires a lightweight interfacing. It's a knit fabric, so we have a knit interfacing as well. You can see that I've already marked the pattern pieces or with the markings, and now I'm going to simply just show you what I marked. And here I get my cutting tools. The first mark is to mark the, the fold, the center front, and I'm going to use a black pen. You would use your fabric marking pen. Then three-fourths of an inch to the left of the center front, Mark, place a line that's t six inches long, six inches from the cut line, three-fourths of an inch, and then six inches long. Now keep in mind that we always have these instructions written in the booklet that accompanies the program. Center front, three-fourths of an inch to the left. We can set this aside now, and now I can mark the garment. We have small samples, but I'll show you we did much the same thing. I placed a nip at the center front, as well as the lower edge. And now I'll mark the center front just to give you a bearing where we are. 
those nips really save time in trying to find where the center front would be. Just little clips. You can see here that I have a strip of fusible interfacing. It's about two inches wide, and I fused it to the left of the center front. I need a little stability there. And then do the same marking, making it six inches long from the neckline, three-fourths of an inch to the left of the center front. Sounding like a broken record, but it's the same markings. We're going to stack the facing to the garment along these three-fourths of an inch markings. They always meet right sides together. So the first time you have to kind of peek underneath to make sure that you are lining the right pattern pieces together. And then let me check underneath here. You may want to place a pin through the bottom area and see how close you come out on the garment. And I'll just move this over just a touch. This is going to be the stitching line. I mentioned it's a one-step stitching. We're going to stitch with a guide, and the guide will be basting tape. I usually use this eighth of an inch wide basting tape to put seams together, to hold seam edges. It's double-sided. Well, we really only need one side, and we need it as a seam guide. Here you can see that I'm sewing along the tape edge. As I'm reaching that bottom point, I'm simply going to shorten my stitch length, sew to a point, and then sew up the other side. So it's a really one step of sewing. After doing the sewing, and here you can see a sample that has been stitched, you can cut right down the center. I've removed the tape, as you can see. Here it's been cut, and if you found that you went one stitch too far, or you clipped a little bit too far, just re-stitch this lower edge to reinforce it. When I flip the stitching, or flip the facing to the inside, you can see how this is forming the placket. When I match the shoulder seams of the left side, the two fabrics align right at the fold. When I match the shoulder seams of the right side, we have the placket, the extension, already formed. Now the next step is to work with a collar. You can use a collar pattern piece and use the single knit or interlock you're working with, or I'm using a knit collar. You wouldn't use such a contrasting collar as I have here, but then match the collar at the center front markings. One edge is finished, one edge is raw, so you can tell which edges to go together, and you pin the collars to the respective center fronts. And I'm just going to use this on the sample. You would have the back shoulder seam stitched at this point, but just to show you where they're matched up, I'd like you to see this. Then simply wrap the facing around the collar, sandwiching the collar between the garment and the facing. Match the shoulder seam of the facing to the shoulder seam of the garment. And let me show you that in an actual another sample that really has a back attached. I have lots of samples, as you might gather. This has been stitched, and it has also been matched properly. The shoulder seam of the facing is aligning to the shoulder seam of the garment. You may find that you have to stretch this front just a little bit because the interfacing has made it a little bit more stable. This pattern called for a fourth of an inch seam allowance, and so that's what we used when sewing around the neckline. And you might want to, before doing any trimming, just turn this right side out to see how it looks. And I'll do that for you now. I'll just turn, first of all, the left side out, bring out the point. Notice where the collar is matched. Now turn the opposite side and bring it to a point. There are a few finishing details left. We need to tack the facing, attach it to the shoulder seam. But here is the underside where the placket is formed. And here is the top side. All it is left are the buttons and buttonholes. Elastics are very functional at the top of skirts, at the top of pants. The seaming is simple with two rows of straight stitching around the top of the waistline and some creative insertion of the elastic. I'll show you how. I'm sure many of you have put elastic into tops of pants or skirts before, but perhaps you'll pick up a pointer or two. When working with elastic, I like to leave room for the elastic to be adjusted as well as inserted 
in the casing itself. The first step I always do is to press the casing under. It's usually an inch and a half width and just press it even prior to doing the stitching of the side seams. On one side seam you're going to leave an opening. Whether you serge the seam or use conventional stitching, stitch to the top fold, to that fold area you can kind of see that I'm pointing to. If you do serge the seam, you may want to, with your traditional machine, regular machine, just stitch at the very top to reinforce the seam. Then leave the rest of the seam open until the very edge, and then catch two or three stitches at the very top. So instead of having an opening of an inch and a half, it's about an inch and a fourth. On a regular seam, you will find that you'll have a straight stitch followed by a zigzag. We detailed that in the first series of this, first program of this series. And this is a small sample just to show you that straight stitch, the zigzag, I reinforce the stitches at the top, and then again stitch the two edges together with two or three stitches at the very top of the casing. Now sometimes I like to do a little basting stitch to save some time and to save frustration, and that's the basting of basting open the seam allowances. I'm going to set my machine for a, just a longer stitch length because this is going to come out in a little bit and stitch the seam allowances down. Just catching those seams. It will come out a little bit later, but it will not interfere with the elastic as it's being inserted through the casing. Now after basting those stitches into place, then press or f follow the fold that you've pressed earlier, you can get rid of all these thread tails, and sew around the top edge. Now if you've pressed this, I've found many times that you really don't even need to do a lot of pinning. If the knit is stable enough, I'm using a heavier weight interlock, and I'll just stitch around the edge at the very fold, and it's not time consuming at all, just guide it along the edge. I'm using a contrasting thread, of course you would use matching thread. Then after stitching along this top edge, then simply follow the lower edge, stitching as close to the lower edge as possible to have a secure seam. This next sample shows how we've done the stitching. The contrasting stitching is at the lower edge. And notice the opening for the elastic. This I keep always open because if I would need to replace the elastic at any time, I have the perfect opening in the top of the skirt or top of the pants. Now for the actual elastic. An inch and a fourth of elastic is what I'm going to be using. You could use as narrow as one inch, but then I would make that casing just a little bit tighter, or snugger. Cut the elastic about two inches shorter than your waistline. Put it around your waistline to make sure it's comfortable before you actually do the sewing. At one cut edge of the elastic, find a piece of, of a scrap of a piece of fabric and zigzag, securely zigzag the elastic to the scrap. This scrap will help keep the elastic from threading through the, or coming out of the elastic casing. You'll see that in a minute. The opposite end, attach a botkin or elastic glide. Using the tip of the botkin, insert it through the opening of the elastic casing and simply thread all of the elastic through the opening. Just keep working and working this through the fabric and pulling the elastic, going a few more inches and pulling the elastic. It'll take a little bit of time to do this working of the elastic, but we took some time on this next sample, and to show you the reason that you attach the extra fabric at the end of the elastic, because as you're pulling through, there's a great tendency for the free end to just slip right through that casing. This extra fabric is a stopping, an anchor, uh, not allowing the elastic to run all the way through. Now, simply butt the ends of the elastic together, and I have this on this next sample, Obviously this will be inside the fabric, but you meet the two elastics together, zigzag, and then trim as we have here. The elastic is very secure to the fabric, and then you trim off the extra fabric, the extra purple fabric, and it will be very flat. You're not going to have an overlap as so often is done in the elastic. This will be very flat and next to the skin. And the gray pair of pants that we have for this ensemble, I took out the basting stitches that were in this area. And here's the elastic, nicely snug inside the casing. You may then want to equally distribute the elastic, kind of pull the two fabrics, the elastic and the pants fabric together, 
And then the last step would be to stitch in the ditch, stitch in this well of the seam to secure the two together at all seams, and your elastic is complete. Vicki is showing us another combination of her knit ensemble. The top, pants, and jacket have all been hemmed with ease, with one two techniques that I'd like to share with you right now. Knit fabrics have stretch, especially along the cross grain, and that's where the hems go, across the lower edge, across the sleeve. They all have a lot of stretch. We've been sewing stretch into the seams with a particular serged or seams with a straight stitch and a zigzag, but now we have to use the same consideration for the hemline. One of the first steps that I work with, especially on a skirt or a top, is to press the hem even before sewing the side seams. It saves me a lot of time later on. It's easier to press a flat piece of fabric than it is to press fabrics that have been sewn into a circle. If you're working with a skirt, perhaps it might have an inch and a half hem. So simply on your ironing board before sewing, meet the cut edge of the fabric to the inch and a half mark on the hem gauge and press. The hem gauge prevents the top edge of the skirt from making an imprint on the fabric, or the top edge of the hem from making an imprint. Just keep advancing this all the way down at that inch and a half mark and press. So pre-pressing saves time and it's really fast. After sewing the skirt side seams or pant side seams, you may want to consider one of the fastest hem techniques that I like to use, and that's with fusible web. Just this one inch or three fourths of an inch wide strip of the fusible web, not the paperback, just the webbing. On the wrong side of the fabric, after you've pressed the hem, place the webbing in place. You may want to set it down just a scant bit, just a hair, so that it's not going to extend beyond the top edge and zigzag with a medium width, a medium stitch length, zigzag the web in place. Very fast. You're not really zigzagging to clean finish the edge, but rather you're zigzagging just to position the webbing. Another option if you had a serger would be to do the same thing, only attach it with a serger. And here this sample shows that the serged edge and the, and the web is in place. You have your hem already marked, and now do some pressing to fuse it into place. I still like to avoid that top edge of the hem. I never like to press on this very top edge. So as I'm steaming, I'm just kind of guiding my iron the edge along the edge of the fabric. Now granted, this is a sample, and you would have your full circular skirt, but you would work in the same technique. After letting this dry, you can give this a stretch, and you can see that the web stretches with the fabric, and you would not have popping of threads. This is a good hem for a top or a skirt. For pants, jackets, garments that get a little bit more wear along the lower edge, I like to use a double needle. We've worked on, with double needles many times on sewing with Nancy. Just as a refresher, the size of the needle is the distance between the needles. I'm using a three millimeter knit double needle. It has knit points on it, suitable for knit fabrics. I press the hem, then stitch from the right side, top stitching the hem in place. Please check a sample, Sti stitching a sample with slightly loosening that top tension so that again you have stretch in your hem where you need it. And those are two easy ways of working with hems on knits. <laughs> In the second program of Easy Does It Knits, I detailed some of the basics, how easy it is to put in elastics, simple hemming techniques, as well as how to put a rugby shirt placket down the front. Keep in mind that the instructions for the placket are on the booklet that accompanies the series. I'll be back with more ideas, this time creative ideas on working with knits, next on Sewing with Nancy. Here's a hint from Nancy's Notions. My Sewing with Nancy booklet collection is one of my best kept secrets. The collection includes booklets containing complete illustrated instructions for my current series, plus a comprehensive subject index so you can easily find information on any sewing topic. The booklets are compiled in an attractive three-ring binder, which opens flat for easy reference. Every six months, you can update your collection with booklets for the newest series, plus a free index for those booklets. It's a great sewing resource. Here's a hint from Ginger. 
When you're doing machine embroidery or cut work, it's sometimes a challenge to trim threads and fabric from the hoop fabric. I keep my curved embroidery scissors close by for just those occasions. The curved blade cleanly cuts threads close to my work without cutting my stitching, and the slender blades allow me to cut right next to my straight stitch cut work design. Another terrific use of the curved embroidery scissors is to trim closely to scallop stitching. This is a very versatile scissors. Here's a hint from Primdritz, the manufacturers of OmniGrid rulers. These precision laser cut rulers give unmatched accuracy. They're made of heavy duty clear acrylic and are perfect for embroidery cutting any color fabric from light to dark. OmniGrid's exclusive double sight lines are printed on the underside of the ruler for greatest accuracy in contrasting black and yellow, enabling you to see the measurements you need. Notice the ease of measuring on this pink fabric as well as a dark print. In addition to the straight cutting lines, you'll find degree lines, 60, 45, and 30, allowing you to cut geometric shapes without the use of templates. I think you can see why I use OmniGrid rulers on TV and at home. Easy Does It Knits is a topic for this mini-series on Sewing with Nancy. Welcome, and thanks for joining me. This third program is on serging and sewing with knits, where I'll detail several specialty techniques, including adding an embroidery design. Rugby and polo shirts are natural candidates for thread accents. For those of you who own a computerized sewing machine, adding an embroidery accent to your project is extremely simple. The only difficult part is choosing which design to use. That's what's next on Sewing with Nancy. Embroidery designs can be added to practically any fabric. The main difference is the type of stabilizer that's used. For knits, we need to stabilize the fabric even more so than woven fabric so it doesn't stretch during the sewing process. We have the knit fabric in the hoop, but before I show you how to add it into the machine, we're going to go through the setup of adding the computerized unit. Now, if you have a computerized unit, follow your owner's instructions. For me, I need to turn off my machine, attach the unit, and then I can turn on, and I'm ready to do the other setups. I've already lowered the feed dogs of my machine, dropping them, because the machine is going to be moving itself to stitch the design. You notice the specialty darning foot that comes along with the creative design. And then also we're going to be working with a specialty needle. The needle is going to be an embroidery needle because we're working with seven different colors of rayon thread. And the fun part about this is choosing the different rayon threads that can be used to create the design. The design is on a computer disc, a CD, a card, however your machine accommodates this. I happen to have this on a card and it fits right into my unit and I'm just about ready to go. I forgot to mention a little bit about the bobbin thread. The bobbin thread is lightweight. You're going to use a lightweight bobbin thread or this as a bobbin thread in cardboard. I don't care what you use, just don't use a heavy thread because it's going to be needed underneath just as a little lightweight support. I'm going to push the card button and choose my design. I'm going to use the croquet mallet. Let my machine talk to me a little bit. It asks me if I've lowered the feed dogs, which if I had, if I have a full bobbin, and I'm ready to go. Now for the fabric and the hoop. Because knit fabrics have a lot of stretch, now this is a Lacoste knit or an interlock knit, and it has a lot of stretch to it. If we didn't stabilize it, it would stretch out a shape in the hoop. So in the hoop, we have placed an iron-on stabilizer or a stabilizer that is just sprayed to the wrong side of the fabric and attached into the hoop itself, not separately, but together, so that this fabric is nice and stable. You noticed on the top that we showed you earlier that the design was on the pocket. Well, rather than cutting the pocket out of, sh out of the pattern shape at first, we cut a larger rectangle so we could fit the whole fabric in the hoop. After the embroidery, then we'll cut out the design. If, you, if this is not a possible for you, if you already have your shape cut out, I'll show you how to deal with that in just a few minutes. So we have the hoop loaded, the machine I think is just about ready to be set up, and I'm going to insert the design, or the hoop, insert the hoop. I'm going to just take one stitch so that I can draw up the bobbin thread, which I will do. The light, I have a light color in here, a little difficult to see. One more time, we'll draw up that bobbin thread, so we'll be ready to go. I like to take two or three stitches at first, place the foot in the sewing position, and take two or three stitches to lock the threads. And then I'll clip off the rest of the threads. Now, this first color is going to sew for just a few minutes, and we'll just let it sew by itself. And while it's sewing, I'll explain 
what you would do with your fabric if you're going to have it cut to shape or it's cut smaller than the hoop area. Let's say your pocket was cut out or, as in this sample, we have the design in the neckline shape of the top. Notice that this portion of the fabric wouldn't have any stability to it. So to accommodate this, we used a different type of stabilizer. And that stabilizer is a paperback sticky back. It has paper on the top side with a gridded portion. We put the paper in the hoop and then scored away the top paper, exposing a sticky stabilizer. Here's a hint. Notice that it's gridded. We place the gridded portion right at the gridded marks at the center point of the hoop. I mark the center of the top with a pin. I fold it in half to find the center point and align the mark and the pin together. I'll remove the pin and apply. This sticky stabilizer adheres to the fabric, makes it flat, so we don't have to worry about any other type of stabilizer. So this is what you'd work with if the design is already cut out and was not the right size for the hoop. I always make a sample run, always. You could use that perhaps for another applique at a later date. But on this pocket, we know exactly where we wanted the design to be. So right now, it's color one has been stitched. So I'm going to raise the presser bar, cut the thread at the design, just clip it close. As I said, sometimes the thread is very comparable to the color of your design, a little difficult to see, but then also clip it at the spool. And then rather than pulling it off the top, I grab the thread by the needle, so let me clip this once more, and then pull the thread through so I'm flossing the machine. Now I'll quickly change thread colors to my next color. The process really involves a lot of changing of threads. So we'll just quickly do this, adding my next color. It's a taupe color. It's not going to be that evident for you. We'll try it one more time. When you're over 40, you need glasses at this point, which I don't have. Here we go. We add the thread, second thread color, and I put the machine in the sewing position. Remember to always give your machine a little love pat so that you can tie, or make sure it's in the sewing position, cut that thread, and then let it sew. As I'm letting it sew, I would need to add five more colors. And this is what the design looks like after you've been stitching. At this point, after stitching, then you can simply place your pattern piece over the design, cut it out to add a great accent. Our sewing now goes from creative to functional. Not, no longer are we working with embroidery designs, but the functional part of putting in buttonholes. Buttonholes and knits are very compatible as long as you follow a few key instructions, and that is to have vertical buttonholes. Since the knit is stable in the lengthwise grain, but yet stretches a lot in the crosswise grain, my preference is to put in the vertical buttonholes. If your pattern calls for crosswise, just change them to vertical. I'm also going to give you a few guidelines of how to stabilize that area while stitching and also after stitching so that the buttonholes stay nice and perfect all through the life of the garment. The first area to stabilize will be the facing, interfacing. We haven't used interfacing in this program until now because we've done such simple sewing, simple elastic and seams and so forth. But the facing of a jacket will require a lightweight fusible interfacing, a knit interfacing. It's Trico that has the fusible sprayed on the wrong side and when it's applied to the interfacing or for the facing of the garment is very pliable and it hasn't changed its drape or shape. It's just given it a little bit of support. Less is best when it comes to interfacing on knits and just use that lightweight interfacing, the knit interfacing. So the front and the back facings all have the interfacing applied to it. The button area, the buttonhole area, you're going to mark on your fabric, but not only marking the front, but for the buttonhole, mark it on the wrong side. On the jacket front, we have marked an area with a tracing wheel where we have the center front where the buttonholes are going to be placed. The reason for doing this is adding a very non-traditional, non-conventional little piece of fabric, and it's really elastic, not fabric. Clear elastic is what I'm going to recommend for you to place down the buttonhole area on the wrong side of the fabric. You can then machine baste it into place. Now the reason for doing this is 
This is usually swimwear elastic, not for buttonholes, but we have found that if you place this in the buttonhole area, it adds to the life of the buttonhole, keeping the buttonhole its size, not getting out of shape. You can baste it down the front with your machine the whole length or just every few inches. And on this sample, I've done it every few inches, and the sample I'm going to sew, it's based at the entire length. However you'd like to do it, give it a try. Just position it in place. On the sample that I'm going to be working with, you can see that basting line down the front of the, this jacket area. Or you could do this on a rugby top. And then I've marked the starting spots of the buttonholes. Now if you didn't have clear elastic, you could certainly use another type of stabilizer, and that would be a water-soluble stabilizer like Avalon or Wash Away. Either of these two products will definitely help give stability to that buttonhole during the sewing process, not necessarily in for the longevity, but it really works quite well. You sew over the top of it and then simply tear it away, and then your buttonhole is ready to be cut open. But let me talk to you or show you a little bit more about sewing that buttonhole into place. I'll sew one buttonhole. I've already checked the size of it so I know how long to make it. I always make a test buttonhole. Sewing down the center of this area, and I've set my machine for a knit buttonhole. If you have that ability, that's a great thing to do at this point. Just sew the length of this buttonhole, and I knew how long I wanted to make it, and just let it sew. Now that elastic is being caught between the fashion fabric and the facing. And we're almost finished. Here we go. And then I would sew all the remaining buttonholes at this point, but I'll just sew one for you, show, telling you or showing you that I've sewn over that elastic. On this next sample, I'm going to show that we have multiple buttonholes in place down the front of this make-believe jacket. And as I fold this back, you can see that the elastic has been caught between those two areas. Now to cut open the buttonholes, I'm going to use a block of wood and a cutter. And this is my favorite way of cutting open buttonholes, and I like you to do it in two steps, not one step. No matter what size of the buttonhole, I usually put half of it on top of the wooden block. Put the end of the blade at the end of the buttonhole and cut, so I'm cutting off the blade. That way this blade is not larger than the buttonhole area. Then flip it to the other side, or move the block, and then cut the other end of it. You're cutting through the elastic, through the fabric, through all the areas, but you can cut that open very easily and it still has a lot of stability in that area. So in working with buttonholes on knits, the ideas to keep in mind are to have vertical buttonholes, add a little stability with clear elastic, or with a water-soluble stabilizer, and you'll have a buttonhole that will last the life of your garment. Use a serger on knits for quick seams as well as decorative accents. This jacket showcases a decorative cover stitch around the neckline. I'd like to show you now how to use this cover stitch for both function as well as for fun. The function of a cover stitch you'll find in knit tops, knit garments, where you'll see a double knit stitch or a double thread stitch, and then on the flip side, the underside, a cover stitch where the thread covers the seam allowances. We're not trimming off any of the seam allowances, we're just sewing over the fabric. In ready to wear, this is a very common stitch, the way they sew it in factories. We can do the same if your machine can be set up for a cover stitch. I followed my owner's guide to set up for the cover stitch. I have three threads. I'm using all-purpose thread since my knit does not have a lot of stretch. If you had very stretchy knits, use a woolly nylon type of thread that has a lot of give and pull. The machine is set up with a flatbed. I have a hammer guide inserted. Your machine guide may call it a flatbed. Notice that it is continuous, much like a traditional sewing machine. The blades are disengaged or lowered. You're not going to be trimming off any extra fabric. Again, follow the guide in your, or the instructions in your owner's guide. I have set my machine for a wide cover stitch. The needles are extra far apart. There's usually a narrow and a wide, and I'm using the wide for knits. For the functional part of a cover stitch, you're simply going to press the hem. I have about an inch to an inch and a fourth hem that has been pressed into place. What I like to do is make a top, pants, perhaps a skirt, press all the hems and stitch them at once on my machine. On the guide, the hem guide, it's white on white, so it's not that noticeable, but it's imprinted with various markings so that I can have a hemming guideline. I'm going to align the fold of the hem line at number two and just search. Do a test. Check your fabric as well as check the stretchability. You may want to lengthen
lengthen the stitch, change the differential feed, whatever, however your machine best works with the fabric. And you'll see from the right side that I have this double needle look stitch. And then from the underside, it covers, covers that raw edge just perfectly so that there isn't any raw edges exposed and it will wear very well. You're going to be sewing in a circle and i show you how to do that. But to save some time, I'm just going to release this from my machine. Now I'm going to press a button that releases the tension of the thread so it makes that kind of unusual noise, but it's a great way to release those threads. On this little top, I'm going to show you how you handle sewing in a circle. I'll find the right end. Here we go. When you're sewing a hem and you get to the, your starting spot, simply overstitch two or three stitches. Then pull the threads to the underside and tie them by hand and clip off the extra thread tails. The way you would traditionally work with a normal seam, you do the same on a serger seam. So that's the functional part. Now the fun part is like the jacket I'm wearing, the decorative stitch exposing the underside of the cover stitch. On this sample, you can see a marking, a white pencil marking on the facing or the wrong side, underside, where I'd like the stitching to follow. It's measured exactly an inch and a half from the fold of the fabric. Rather than sewing on the right side, we're going to sew on the underside. Placing that white mark underneath the presser foot, there's a guide in the middle of the presser foot, and just surge over the white marking and encasing that edge. I do put a few pins in there to position it. Take them out before you surge over the edge. Gently make that curve of the corner or the shaping of the facing and continue. Now, my sample is simply that. It's not a complete jacket, it's a sample. So you'll be sewing from one end to the other. And again, I'll just release this. And you would sew all around the neckline but it gives a very interesting decorative stitch, again, duplicated from ready to wear. I hope you'll give these a try. During this series on Easy Does It Knits, I've shown you how easy it is to stitch a top, pants, skirt, and jacket, and combinations of all the above. When working with tops, probably the easiest neckline treatment is the jewel neckline, where we simply turn under a fourth of an inch and top stitch into place. The polo or rugby shirt is a little bit more detailed, but simple, with that one seaming technique that I showed you how to work with. Jackets of knits are really simple as well, keeping in mind that if you put in buttonholes to make sure that they're vertical, not horizontal. And skirts and pants have simple side seams plus easy elastic in the casing. The other neckline we worked with on a top was a one, two, three neckline, rib neckline, either mock turtleneck, turtleneck, or crew neck. They're all put on in the same technique. We've made about eight pieces in this ensemble using these four colors. And I have a storyboard to show you with eight pieces, you can simply get about 12 different color combinations from working with the very classic black and red for more elegant wear or using the gray combination for more casual wear. And then taking the black and gray and combining or mixing and matching them together with different tops. Here you see two of the different tops that we worked with. And then another combination, working with, again, reversing the color combinations of black and gray and combining more tops. Knits are fast to sew and very versatile. I hope you give them a try. Here's one more hint before ending the series on Easy Does It Knits. Going back to the idea of working with buttonholes in knits, vertical buttonholes and stabilized with clear elastic. After putting the buttonholes in, remove the basting stitch as we have done in the top section of the sample. You could also remove the excess clear elastic and then leave the elastic in the buttonhole area to give it additional stability. I hope you'll try this technique as well as others on Easy Does It Knits. Bye for now. Visit Nancy's website at www.sewingwithnancy.com for more information on this program. Sewing with Nancy has been made possible by grants from the following companies. FOP, simply the best European line of sewing machines. Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears. Madeira Threads, designed for home and professional embroiderers everywhere. Oxmoor House, publishers of sewing, quilting, and craft books.
Prim Drifts, the source for sewing and quilting notions. And Nancy's Notions Sewing Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and notions.